just introduce, introduce Sean Lawman. Um, he is a sports data guru. Uh, he's presently the um, database manager for Sabre. Um, he's uh, really had the databases that uh, predated uh, baseball reference. Um, he's done football encyclopedias, baseball encyclopedias. Um, all around good guy. Um, sure. Day job is as a watchdog reporter for the DNC, which he still has, so congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, without further ado, here's Sean Lawman. He's going to be talking to you about baseball, the information you need. So I gave a talk at the, uh, at the Sabre Conference in Philadelphia um, about three years ago where I talked about how um, some of these new technologies are really um, having a revolutionary impact on the game. Um, the technologies I'm talking about are not really unique to baseball. Um, advances in uh, video technology, uh, computer processing ability, computer networks, um, those have had an impact throughout uh, the world, of course, healthcare advances, uh, law enforcement, uh, the retail experience. Um, but I wanted to talk today a little bit about how um, our ability to capture massive amounts of uh, information is really transforming the way that uh, baseball teams operate both on and off the field. Baseball has always been an information game, and back to um, um, you know, back to the days of Alexander Cartwright, uh, the innovators understood that you could get a competitive advantage by uh, understanding how each player's performance uh, contributes to winning. Um, and to understand, I think, how technology is really changing that, I think we need to go back and, uh, and look at what, we talk about baseball data, baseball statistics, what that meant um, 150 years ago. This is... Um, the first box score that was published in an American newspaper from 1845, and as you can see, it didn't really have a lot of information. It's the names of the players, how many runs they scored, how many outs um, they made in the field. Um, it didn't really take uh, too much effort to realize you needed more than just a single component on offense and defense um, to, to understand the contributions that any player was making who the better players were, who the players were that uh, maybe should be on the bench. Um, obviously, this advanced over time. This is a, a box score from 1876, the first year of the National League. Uh, and you can see they've added now three uh, categories for offense, three for defense. Um, the box score evolved. It continued to evolve over time. Uh, you'll notice what's missing here. Um, a lot of things. RBIs were not added really until the 1920s. Um, there's no pitching data here. We didn't start uh, uh, keeping such good track of that until the 1950s. Um, but that, that kind of represents, I think, um, the idea that our interest in uh, baseball statistics and, and data about the game is not new. It's been an ongoing evolution all the way back to uh, the 19th century. And um, our advances in the understanding of the game have all been driven by our, our willingness to capture more information about what's going on. I want to show you a couple more um, moments in time. This is a, a page out of the, the first uh, baseball encyclopedia, really, that was published uh, in this country in 1951 by Turkin and Thompson. You can see still, while we do have, we're starting to put up uh, uh, a player's entire career, there's really not a lot of detail there. Uh, fast forward 15 or 20 years to 1969, this is uh, the Macmillan Encyclopedia, which was the first time that uh, we used computers to try to um, um, really get an accurate um, statistical record. Um, it's, a, as I said, a constant evolution and an expansion in the amount of data that we're collecting. If you think about this, the number of players that there are in a league in a given season, um, and the number of data points for each player, it comes out to about 1,500 data points um, as a whole season's worth of data out of, uh, out of this kind of model. And when you go forward and start collecting uh, that much information, it's maybe 12,000. 
Um, the big change really came as we got into the 1980s. Uh, and a guy named Bill James who said, there's only so much that you can learn from this single line for every player. You really need to have game by game, uh, game, by game information. And he started, um, as many of you know, publishing his baseball abstracts, which were based on his own research uh, into box scores, uh, which gave him about 200,000 data points per season. So it was really an explosion of information that he had available to him. And uh, he's been called the father of uh, sabermetrics because of the work he did. Um, things like pitcher run support, umpire statistics, uh, something even as simple, seemingly simple as stolen base statistics, uh, statistics for catchers. Um, so that kind of information wasn't available. The data wasn't available. And uh, more than uh, more than coming up with formulas, what he was really doing was counting things that nobody else was counting, building these big data sets, and uh, and pulling out interesting bits. And of course, the more information you start to gather, if you're going to gather game-by-game -game information, why not play-by-play -play information? Um, he formed a group called Project Score Sheet in the late 80s, which many of you know, and uh, a network of people across the country to collect play-by-play -play accounts from every game. If you're going to do play-by-play, -play, why not do pitch-by-pitch? -pitch? Um, and that's what, that's what happened, of course. Increasingly larger data sets, and so what happens? Once you have play-by-play -play data, you can start looking at player splits, uh, situational stats, lefty, righty, matchups, things like that. Um, what always happens is um, people aren't necessarily asking questions and going to look for the data that could give them the answers. Rather, they're gathering the data and saying, what does this information tell us? And um, you know, one of the things we learned when we started counting how many pitches pitchers threw in each game, but probably not a good idea to let your starters throw 150 pitches every day. Um, and uh, this is where we are now with the advent of, of Major League Baseball's Pitch FX system. Um, if you don't know about that, that's a system that they use to measure the speed and trajectory of every pitch uh, in every Major League Baseball game. It's 27 measurements taken on every pitch, uh, which works out to about 6,700 data points for each game, or 16 million data points for every season. And uh, if you've watched any games on TV, um, I'm sure you've seen um, at least a public face of what that looks like. This is, um, this is how it shows up on, uh, on the television, or on the computer screen. Um, based on the speed and the trajectory of the ball, software can identify the type of the pitch. It's a fastball, a curveball, a slider. Um, of course, it measures the speed of the pitch pretty accurately. Um, and with the chart in the center, it shows you um, the path the pitch took, not only um, where it ended up over the strike zone, but how it moved as it got there. Um, there have been a lot of interesting things that have come out of this data. I think one of the most interesting things has been the concept of pitch framing. Um, that's, that's the idea that catchers can position themselves in a way that uh, encourages umpires to call more uh, borderline pitches as a strike. There had been a lot of debate over whether that was a real thing or not among um, scouts and catchers. Um, but once we had this data, um, not only were we able to show that it was real, but um, to understand it's, that some catchers were better at it than others, and, and teams have been able to um, identify catchers who do that well and, and uh, pay them a lot of money. Um, this, the data, this pitch FX data also lets us really more accurately quantify the effectiveness of individual pitchers. We don't have to just rely on a scout to tell us that a guy has a great curveball. Um, we can measure the amount of horizontal and vertical uh, movement every pitch has. And over time, you can also then see which pitchers are getting better, uh, how well a young prospect is developing, as well as maybe an older pitcher who's losing a little bit. Um, and we can measure even those changes during the course of a game um, to see if a pitcher is getting tired or maybe he just doesn't have anything that day. And 
I just got this example from Game 7. Um, if hopefully some of you stayed awake long enough to watch it. Um, as you know, Roldis Chapman, the Cubs' top reliever, was used pretty heavily. Um, and he came into the, the seventh inning, or to the ninth inning of the seventh game of the World Series. And uh, uh, Roldis Chapman, if you don't know him, is one of the hardest throwers in the game. He, uh, his average fastball last year was 100.4 miles per hour. And uh, needless to say, that's his favorite pitch. He throws it about 80% of the time. But when he came into the ninth inning uh, against the Indians, um, his first, I don't know if you can see that too well, the pitches are numbered there. The first three pitches he threw were sliders, and they, they weren't very good. The number two and three just dropped out of the strike zone there. Um, and then pitch four was a fastball he threw that was, was way outside. It was about 92 miles an hour, which is a pretty good pitch for most guys, but for Rollis Chapman, it's almost a changeup. Um, and then uh, the, the fifth pitch was a, a fastball right down the middle that Santana hit for a, a flyout. But he was worn out, and you didn't have to guess at that by looking at his face. Um, the data showed it. And uh, it's remarkable. All of this is, is gathered in real time, and it's available to the public. It's something you couldn't have imagined 10 years ago, but now we just take it for granted. I want to talk a little bit about um, the technology that underlies the system. I could go through a dozen more of these kinds of charts and, and graphs and make some interesting observations, but I'm really more interested in talking about the technology that underlies this because I think it gives a hint um, to the, the fact that we're just really scratching the surface with, uh, with what's possible here. Um, here's how the system works. It's really deceptively simple. This is a picture, I believe, from Texas. Uh, it's three cameras. They're pretty high-definition cameras, and they're mounted in clusters in the stadium. Um, it captures uh, high-definition images, 30 frames per second, and there's some really sophisticated computer software behind them. It's trained to identify the baseball in every picture, every frame of, of uh, video that's captured, and make precise measurements on the location of the ball. Now, obviously, a person sitting there with pen and pencil can't do this. For years, the way we've gathered uh, data about baseball is a scorekeeper sitting there with a messy scorecard. Um, there's limits to how much a person uh, by themselves can do, and of course, there's there's human error and there's variability. But this, this pitch FX system, which is now almost 10 years old, isn't constrained by those those limits. And this is really the future of, of data analysis, not just in baseball, but um, in, in all endeavors. It's not increasingly larger um, spreadsheets. It's raw videos of games, and it's smart computer systems that can analyze that video. Um, you can, obviously, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to conceptualize that you could take this system, which looks at pitched balls, and expand it um, to cover the whole field. And uh, obviously, we're doing that now. This is the, uh, this is, there's a couple of different systems that major league teams are using. This is one called FieldX by the same company that does pitch FX. Um, and uh, uh, major league teams have been using this for a couple of years. It shoots the same high resolution shots of the field, um, the entire field. The computer software is able to identify each human uh, being that's there. It's able to identify the baseball, and thus it's able to, to uh, understand each discrete event that's happening. So when the ball is pitched, when it's hit, when the fielder catches the ball, when they throw the ball, um, when batters touch bases, everything that you can imagine. Um, the computers know how to, how to identify that and to keep track of it. It uses two clusters of HD cameras, and uh, the system also uses radar technology, but it creates a 3D image of the entire field, 40,000 frames of video per second, um, and that gets converted into digital data. So a routine play like a ground ball to shortstop generates 21,000 lines of data. So if you want to know why teams are buying supercomputers and filling up offices with uh, MIT grads, it's to figure out what to do with this data 
and to figure out how they can use it to make uh, their teams better. A lot of that work that they're doing is proprietary, um, but you've probably seen stuff like this. Uh, MLB calls it StackCast. Um, they pull some interesting nuggets out of it. How fast did a base runner uh, go from first to third? How far did the outfielder travel to catch that ball? Um, I think the real breakthrough from this kind of technology and data may be uh, a really robust look at uh, defensive uh, metrics. And when you think about it, for 150 years, um, you know, we've kept track of errors. How often, say, an outfielder drops a fly ball, but we've never really figured out how to track how good a player was at getting to those balls in the first place, uh, which is probably more important. Um, now we can do that with uh, uh, keeping track of very precisely where balls are hit, where fielders start, and whether or not they catch balls. We can now look at, a, at a, any particular ball and say, on average, a center fielder is going to get to that ball 60% of the time. And uh, if your guy's getting to it only 40% of the time, maybe you've got an issue. Um, if you want to know why every team in Major League Baseball is using defensive shifts, it's because we're really um, putting together some solid data on where every ball is hit. And the teams can call this up. Um, in the dugout. Teams this year, I believe, are uh, started being allowed to use iPads uh, in the dugouts, and this is what they're looking at. This is a spray chart for Jay Bruce, formerly of the Reds, of every ground ball he um, hit in 2015, and as you can see, he's not hitting anything to the opposite field. So it doesn't make any sense. For years, we've positioned fielders kind of in a semicircle, evenly spaced around the the infield, but if none of the balls are getting hit to the to the third base side, there's no reason to have two players over there. This is not um, the spray charts really not anything new. Teams have used scouts for years to kind of track these things by hand, um, and it was the whole process of of guys sitting in the stands with pencil and paper, um, a very intense manual effort. And of course, as with anything, there's human error in that, there's variability, and uh, we don't have that anymore. It's more and better data being captured through the use of technology. And here's another thing to consider uh, why this is so revolutionary. By capturing all of this video, um, we're creating these libraries of information that we can go back and tap into later. If there's something that you think of that you want to keep track of um, that you didn't, you can program the computer to detect that, go back and, and reanalyze the video. So if you want to, let's say you want to figure out how often your batters jog to first on a fly ball, you can train the computer to detect that and then just run through the video. In the older process where a person's sitting there and writing it down on pen and paper, if you didn't get it the first time, it's gone. The information is gone. Nobody thought um, it was worthwhile to record the play-by-play -play accounts of 19th century games very often. We didn't track pitch counts for guys like Walter Johnson or Bob Feller. Um, we don't, don't have any real good data about how much ground Willie Mays covered at the polo grounds or how often Ted Williams hit a ball in left field. And we're never going to know those things. Um, some of the organizations have started installing these camera systems in their minor league facilities, it's, uh, it's expensive, not just to gather the data, but to, um, to do the analysis of it. But, um, you know, when you're spending millions of dollars, and uh, in some cases maybe even billions of dollars on player payroll over time, um, it's, uh, it's not that big of an investment. Um, I haven't even touched on some of the really cool technology that's uh, going on behind the scenes. Um, teams are doing a lot of work on uh, biometrics, looking at uh, pitching motions and uh, hitter swings, um, not just to try to figure out ways to make them better players, but to um, try to understand ways they can prevent injuries. Um, I saw a number that said close to a billion dollars was spent on, on players who had Tommy John surgery over the past few years. Invest a lot of money, particularly in pitchers that uh, never see the field, uh, 
figuring out how to prevent those injuries or at least how to increase recovering times is, is worth a lot of money uh, and all the teams are looking at this. Um, uh, teams are wearing um, the wearable devices, not just like the Fitbits that we have, but more complex devices that are tracking um, their physical performance, and not just on the field, but during workouts and um, even when players are sleeping. So uh, this, the technology is interesting uh, to some of us. I think uh, maybe to some of you it's, it's, um, it's less interesting. Um, I know there are a lot of people who think the proliferation of data and statistics detracts from their enjoyment of the game, even during broadcast. Um, and I, I don't necessarily argue against that. I think that's okay. Um, you can still come up to Frontier Field and sit in the stands uh, and ignore all of that stuff and have essentially the same experience that people did at the ballpark 50 years ago. Uh, although the seats are more comfortable and the beer is a little colder. Um, but for the teams, I think um, anybody who wants to be competitive uh, needs to embrace this kind of technology, uh, needs to master it, and needs to invest in it because the pace of, of technological change is uh, very rapid, and what's new and cutting edge today is going to be um, obsolete in a couple of years. So um, for teams, um, it's... Uh, there's, there's no debate, they need to be uh, players in this. So that's all I have. Anybody have any questions? Sean, yeah. um, the commissioner has talked about getting rid, exploring the possibility of getting rid of these defensive shifts and so forth. How do you feel about that? Because obviously what you're showing is, makes tremendous sense. My feeling is beat the shift and teach them how to bunt or, or whatever, like instead of taking that element of the game away. I agree with that. I think. Um, it's a, it's a strategy that has, in some cases, it hurt, has hurt players. I think I use the example of Jay Bruce. I think he's one in particular because he's not been able to adjust his game. Um, you know, they, they were using the shift against Ted Williams 50 years ago. Um, I don't think that, you know, to the extent that uh, these things are helping some teams have a competitive advantage, I don't see there's a problem with that. And uh, it's not just the shift. There's other strategies that we see um, that uh, sometimes they're, they're more visible than others. Um, there's a really good book written last year. I think it came out last year by Travis Sawchip, who was a beat writer in Pittsburgh covering the Pirates. Uh, it's called Big Data Baseball. And he talked about how that team really embraced on, a, on an organizational level um, this idea that they were going to, I guess for lack of a better word, a scientific approach. Let's study things uh, that may be conventional wisdom and see if they make any sense. Like playing your defensive players evenly around the infield. That didn't make any sense. One of the things the Pirates were able to do, uh, have been able to do, is to take pitchers um, kind of off the scrap pile and resurrect their careers. Francisco Liriano was a good example of that a couple of years ago. Um, they've been a little bit tight-lipped about exactly what it was that they saw that made them think they could turn his career around, but uh, they're certainly doing it. And uh, so I, I would not be in favor of, uh, of making any strategic limitations like that a rule. One more is, it, is it possible to go back to the old video archives and apply the technology to the, to the film? It is in some cases, but you know, one of the things that's really interesting is that not a lot of full game footage exists, uh, even for games during the television era. Um, teams did not keep, uh, even the super stations that broadcast a lot of games didn't keep footage of a lot of those. Um, so it's possible to do that for, for some segments, but not a whole lot. And even going back in time, much before the 1950s, there's not a lot of game footage on film. Now football, which had always used film study, is a different story. We have game footage of games going back to the 1920s, uh, but not in baseball. So I think that's it. Thank you very much.